puts us out into the darkest night. Today we pick up on the second part of the subject of the model church and hopefully being able to get to a model ministry that we want to look at in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14 and Ephesians chapter 4. Hope I can get there. But those are such important uh, scripture portions. And we've looked at this uh, Revelation chapter 3, the only church, the Philadelphian church, the only church in the of those seven churches in the Revelation 2 and 3 that Jesus didn't rebuke, that uh, he didn't reprove them. And we've covered a few points, and I'm going to just pick up in the eighth verse of that chapter in a few minutes. But we looked at Christ's introduction, how he introduced himself and the meaning of that. And then we looked at Christ's, uh, we're looking now at Christ's commendation as the second point. I told you that the third point that I want, a major point that I want to bring before you is uh, that Christ's promises, and then fourthly, his encouragements. And I pray, I pray that this message will really encourage you, be a blessing to your heart. But we, we looked at the fact that he, Jesus is holy and he's true, that he is the one who holds the keys of David, and that was about authority, and that uh, he is the doorkeeper or the gatekeeper. We covered that in the first uh, part of this message. And uh, I want to pick up now and, and, and look at these Christ's commendations. And we have covered a little bit of this. First of all, he, he commends them for the fact that they have little strength and how what a surprise that is and an, kind of an un, certain, uh, kind of a thing that you wouldn't have thought was, was a commendation. We looked at why. And then also that he says that uh, you've kept my word and what that means. Um, so now I want to pick up and just look at this third little statement that he makes. In, in chapter three, uh, Revelation 3, verse 8, and I want to just read a bit of it to you. He says this, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word. So I'm going to look at that now. You've kept my word and you have not denied my name. What do those things mean? And then he says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. And hopefully we'll read that a little bit more a little later. But what does it mean, I have not denied my word? There's, there's, there are obvious things like, well, uh, teaching that the Word of God is fallible, that it's not infallible, that it's, uh, it has human errors, that it, maybe that it was written by humans and not divinely inspired by God, kept uh, pure, uh, undiluted, um, no errors. Those things, you know, when we, when we deny the inspiration of the Scriptures, well, or if we reject it, that's denying His Word, if you water it down, if you claim it's not relevant uh, to society today, it was written for a past age. Any of those things, are, you know, in other words, making the Word of God like any other book is to die, deny His Word. But what about choosing those parts of the Word of God that, 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 uh, and rejecting other parts, parts that you like at the expense of parts you don't like? What about willfully disobeying it, ignoring what it says? All of those, to me, are denying God's Word, deliberately teaching that um, only parts of it are relevant for today. In other words, dissecting it, um, fitting into different time periods, etc., and saying, not today. What about distorting parts of the, the Word of God to make it culturally acceptable, leaving out parts? that culture would oppose us on, um, only preaching the parts that are acceptable to people? What about emphasizing parts that you use to prove your point, like Jesus, like the devil did with, with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, when he chose certain parts and said, the word of God says, but Jesus had to say, but it also says. You see that to, re to just accept one part or emphasize one part uh, at the expense of other other parts, 
and denying, leaving parts out, just because that's what the devil was trying to do there. He was just trying to manipulate Jesus and control him. And we can do the same. We can say, like husbands often say to wives, wives, you've got to obey me. The word of God says that. Wives sometimes say to the husbands, hey, you've got to love me like Christ loved the church. And we use them, while they, those are words from the scriptures and they are truths, we use them to manipulate and control others. That is to deny the word of God. We're denying the truth of the word of God. And so we, we've got to remain true to, well, well, let me just say this too. Sometimes we can use the word of God selfishly to suit our own needs, to self-promote, to manipulate control. We must remain true to the whole counsel of God. As Paul said in, in Acts chapter 20, verses 27 and onward, he said, I've not neglected or I've not hesitated to preach the whole counsel, the whole will of God to you, to teach it with integrity. And remembering this, that the whole word of God, the whole word from Genesis 1, verse 1, right to the last verse and word in, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, all of it is truth. Jesus himself said that. He said in John 17, 17, speaking to the Father, he said, your word is truth. Your word is truth. Now, remember this. When Jesus referred to the word of God, he was speaking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. When Paul and Peter and these that wrote the letters refer to the scriptures, they generally, generally are referring to the Old Testament. They didn't have the complete Bible like we have it today. Paul wrote some letters that were incorporated into the Word of God. But when he was writing those letters and, and preaching and teaching, he was using the Old Testament. So don't let anybody tell us that the whole Word of God is no longer relevant today. It is. Every part of it. And to leave parts of it out... It, is not is to deny the word of God. It's all truth from Genesis to Revelation. So we'll move on now to Christ's promises. That was, you have not denied my word and uh, that you've kept it. And uh, we, need to, we need to be doing that. So Christ's promises for those who follow his endorsements, the things we've just covered now. And we, we've read part of that in, in Revelation chapter 9. It goes through to verse 13. And each one of them is actually an encouragement for us. So I want you to be encouraged by the word of God. He says there in verse 9 that he will make those who belong to Satan and oppose us, he'll make them acknowledge our faith and that Christ really does love us and that he is going to return. He's going to make them fall before his throne and he's going to, they're going to have to say the Christians were right. We opposed, we fought, we denied, we rejected, we, we did all sorts of things, ridiculed, mocked, scoffed, even beheaded and killed, but they were right. And God's going to make all of those from the beginning of time right to the end of time, every one of them come and bow down and say they were right. So be encouraged. This is God's truth and God's for us. And if God can be for is for us, who can be against us? Secondly, he says that he'll keep us from, not in, but from the hour of trial that is, will come upon the whole earth. You'll see that in the 10th verse there. It's not, he'll keep us in, he'll keep us from. That means we won't be there. He will have taken us to be with him with all of the, he'll rescue us and he'll take us to be with him for all of time and for eternity. Now we didn't read the 11th verse, but Jesus says this, and we'll, I'll just read it to you now. He says, I'm coming soon. So hold on to what you have so that no one can take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will I leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him also my new name. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I just want to quickly touch those few verses. His quick return, he's going to come in an instant, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye, 
of an hour to shout of the the archangel and the 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 voice the, the trumpet sound christ will come back and we will be changed and you can see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through to 18 which i'd love you to read uh, you could maybe pu 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 uh, push the pause button and read those scriptures again even if you know them let them just get into your heart again and then he says this amazing thing this wonderful thing to me no one can steal or take away our crowns revelation uh, chapter 3 the, the middle part of that, that 11th verse. How is it that no one can take our crown? Well, first of all, 1 Peter 1 5 tells us we are kept by the power of God. God keeps us. John chapter 18, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse uh, 28 says that no man can snatch, snatch us out of his hand. The book, Romans chapter 8, tells us that. Nothing in all the world can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So they're crowns as rewards that God has for all of us who've been faithful to him. And, and God says no one can snatch your crown. He will make sure of that. So just imagine that. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's, it's just an amazing thing. But then he goes on and he talks about his internal, eternal presence. Revelation chapter 3 verse 12. He says, he'll be with us forever. Can you imagine that? We're going to be gathering with all of the redeemed, all the angels, the hosts of heaven, all of the redeemed, those songs that they sing in the book of Revelation. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to be there standing with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, with Moses, with Elijah and all these prophets, with Paul, with all the angels all the different ranks of the angels with people you know. I'll be there. Hopefully you'll be there because you've trusted Jesus. He says, we're going to just enjoy God forever. Just think of it, gathering with all the redeemed, the angelic hosts, worshipping him, serving him, praising him, with him always, before him, with him, enjoying him, glorious, majestic, awestruck by him. God, when we see him face to face, see him as he really is, all of this, wow, wow, wow. And then to have his new name written on us, what a wonderful thing, amazing. So he says, hold on. Look at that in the 11th verse, his encouragements for us to just embrace these encouragements that he gives us. He says, hold on. In other words, just live out faithfully the hope that you have in Jesus. Remain faithful. Don't let anything make you quit. Jesus will always remain faithful, no matter what. So keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercies of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep yourself in the love. And as 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 tells us, and this is a wonderful encouragement when you think of holding on, even when it gets tough, he will never allow us to be tempted above what we're able to endure. He'll always make a way of escape. Wonderful God. So first of all, his encouragement is, hold on, he's encouraging us. It's not just a command, it's an encouragement. And then he says, overcomers will be pillars in his, in, in his temple. Everyone who overcomes. In the New Testament, the word temple refers to that inner sanctuary, that inner part of the temple of God that was in Jerusalem, where the presence of God was. And uh, it was, you can read Matthew 20, uh, 23, verse 35, it, it, where God's presence remained. So he says, we're going to become pillars of that, that part of the temple. In the Old Testament, the sanctuary. So pillars... The temple and the pillars. He'll make pull us pillars in the temple of God. Pillars is, a, is a, a picture of strength. And all overcomers then, just to put this together, all overcomers, every one of us, who held on and overcome, he's going to make us, over, over, he will enjoy his presence and his strength now and forever. Praise God. And then he says this, Keep your ear open. In other words, listen carefully. 
to what I say, not only now, but ongoingly. There's a wonderful promise uh, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 and 5, that I'd like to just quickly read to you. If you would just turn it with me, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 and 5. Listen to this. Often when I'm going to preach, I claim this. Morning by morning, sometimes I just say this to the Lord. Lord, this is your promise to me. I'm asking you to do the same. Now listen, it says the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. So God's going to help me to have a tongue that can teach. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. So listen carefully to what he has to say to you. Day by day, he's got so much more that he wants to say. As, as the book of Revelation tells us, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Matthew chapter 1 verse 15 tells us that too. Revelation 2 29. And so it goes on through the scriptures. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Now, please, as we move on to this model of ministry, just remember this, that if if the door of your heart has somewhere closed, is not totally wide open, if some parts of it will be closed, those doors that I spoke about, prayer and praise, access to the throne room, whatever it may be, Jesus has this wonderful promise in this, this verse, this chapter, in the 20th verse of Revelation 3. He says this, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If you just open the door, I'll come in and we'll have fellowship again. If all this becomes real again, simple as saying, Lord Jesus, here I am. I've closed the door or areas of, of my life. I just open them to you now. Come in. I want to sup with you. And he says, boy, I'll be right in there as quick as that. So let's have a quick look now. We've got a little bit of time to look at a model of ministry. And I don't have time to read all of this, but I'm going to ask you to read the whole chapter of Romans chapter, uh, chapter uh, 12. I'm going to read just a few verses of Romans chapter 12 to you. And then we'll have a quick look at what it says there and uh, how it can change our lives and ministries. So looking at Romans 12, and remember, we need Ephesians chapter 4 too, but Romans 12 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice or living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Then you will be able to test and approve what God's perfect, what God's will is, his good pleasing and his perfect will. For by the grace given me, I wanted, I say to everyone, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the, accordance with the faith the measure of faith that God has given you. And just as there are each one of us, each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. We <clears throat> sorry, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift, now we're talking about ministry gifts, is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So, here he's giving us what scriptures refer to as really the, 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 the gifts of Christ, the gifts that Jesus gives us. And it, we have in, in the book of Romans, by and large, we have the, the, the ascension gifts. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, it is he, Jesus, who gave, when he ascended into heaven, he gave gifts to men. And he says, to some he gave to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers 
for the edifying of the saints, etc., to do the work of the ministry. So these are the ascension gifts, the Jesus gifts, the gifts that Christ has given to us, the gifts of Jesus. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, by and large, you have the gifts of the Spirit, not the gifts of Jesus, but the gifts of the Spirit. And in Romans chapter 12, by and large, it covers both portions, the gifts, the Jesus gifts, the ascension gifts, and the gifts of the Spirit. And that also, in some parts of 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, you'll see that the gifts of Jesus are brought in and the gifts of the Spirit. So just trying to differentiate between the two. There's a gift, the gifts of the Spirit, and there's the gifts of Jesus, the ascension gifts. All right, so let's have a look now at how we can be, what, what a model is of these ministries. What, what's required of us for us to be able to model out the ministries that are in the Word of God, the Bible way. First of all, he says in, in Romans 12, one and two, chapter 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. So this is consecration. Your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service. So it's surrender and sacrifice, consecration, total consecration. We make ourselves, if you want to model biblical ministry, you can't hold back on parts of yourself. You can't reserve options. You've got... You've got to lay down all your rights. Make yourself totally available to God. Your body, your soul, your spirit, everything you have, every, you, everything, the totality of our being available to God. No false agendas, nothing held back from Him. It's a willingness to say, Lord, I deny myself and I'm going to take up my cross daily. That's the first thing, consecration. The second thing is transformation. Because Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this present world. Don't try to, even as a preacher, as a leader, as a Christian, don't try to impress people by trying to be like the world. Be not conformed to this present world. Don't follow their fashions. Don't follow the, their standards. Don't follow their speech patterns. No dirty jokes. No suggestive stuff. No double meaning words, sentences, you hear what I'm getting at? But we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. How? How does our mind get renewed? By the Word of God, which is the mouth of God, and by the Spirit of God, who transforms us from one degree of glory into the, the next, makes us more and more like Jesus. We've been conformed to the image of Christ, and it's by the Word and by the Spirit. So have a genuine hunger to act like, to think like, to speak like, to be like Jesus in every area of your life. Nothing held back, no reservations. The Holy Spirit must be in control of our lives. We must come to the place in our lives, if we're going to model ministry from the Bible, where we're in living in total obedience to Christ. And if we fell up for a moment, we're quick to repent, quick to ask forgiveness, and quick to get on, on with, the, with the job. Do what he tells you to do. Stop doing everything he tells you to stop doing. No excuses. Let, it, let today be a place where you commit yourself with a radicalism. And then thirdly, not only is there, does it require consecration and not only does it require transformation, but it, it tells us in the third verse that it requires evaluation. If we're going to be model ministries from the Bible, like the Bible, the scriptures teach, we're going to have to evaluate ourselves. So let me read that, that verse to you again in verse 3. It says, <clears throat> Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober ju judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Think like Jesus thinks. You want to know how Jesus thinks? Have a look at Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 through to 11. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, who... Though being in, uh, in the image of God, the absolute rep replica, the totality of what God is, he thought not equality with God a thing to be grasped at, but made himself a servant. This is part of, have a look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through to 11. No more acting like we're someone 
that we aren't no more put on, no more super spiritualities. Let God's word always be the yardstick that by which we compare ourselves. And we don't compare ourselves with others. We don't compare our church with other churches. We compare ourselves and our church. We evaluate it in the, in the face of the word of God by the Holy Spirit helping us. Moving on quickly. Consecration, transformation, evaluation. And then we get from verse 4 right through to verse 21, participation. And while I can't read all these things to you, I want to highlight a few things and pin, highlight the verses for you to look up for yourself. But first of all, in participation, there is unity. We've got to come to the place that we understand there is only one body. One body of Christ. It's the totality of all the born-again Christians everywhere in the world. Every denomination, every local church, every whatever the little group calls itself. If it's in isolation and in, re in, in reaction against the rest of the body of Christ, it's still part of the body. There's only one body. And you and I have got to come to the place, if we want to model biblical ministry, then we're going to have to start to, we're going to have to stop competing with one another, criticizing one another, judging one another, making out like me better than what our church is better than others, and etc. So there has to be unity. Secondly, there has there's diversity. This is a wonderful thing to me. God doesn't want us all to be like the, exactly the same little cookie cut thing, you know. God wants is God has made me me. He made you you. Our church is different to other churches. Diversity, there's room for it all. And when we try to make everybody conform to what we're like instead of conform to what he's like, and none of us is going to get that right. And so when we see the totality of the unity of the body of Christ, and then we see the diversity of it, we stop trying to make people like us. Yes, Paul said, be followers of me, but he says, as I follow Christ. So our ultimate goal is for people to become like Christ. That's biblical ministry. That's model ministry. Not to speak like us, talk like us, dress like us, cut our hair like us, whatever the case may be. Just let people be themselves. Each one of us has a part to play. No two parts play exactly the same part. We're all different and every one of us is absolutely essential, needed. And when people leave our church, we, the church is at a, loses something very valuable. Because no one can take that person's part. They can do what they were doing to some degree, but they can never be what that person was in our, our, our unity and uh, our, our, our diversity in our unity. And then in verse 9, he talks about sincerity. We can't play around. We can't like hold back or put on We've got to be sincere. And then in verse 16, he talks about humility. Humility is a, one of the traits of the life of Jesus. He was humble. No boasting, no arrogance, no self-promoting. Biblical ministry. Paul can call himself the chief of all sinners, the least of all the apostles. To me, Paul was the greatest apostle outside of a great apostle of our faith, Jesus. And yet he, called, he had none of this pride and arrogance, even when he talks about his visitation into heaven. He talks about it in a way that he tries not to let boasting come into it. Man, can I ask you, as God's servant, lay down all this pride and this arrogance and this need to be needed. Lay it all down. Need to be number one. Just become humble. That's biblical ministry. And then... Verses 14 to 20, verse 21, talks about generosity. Generosity and, gracious, and, and graciousness are so interlinked in Scripture. Just be gracious, just be generous, be willing to give away something every day, even if it's just a word of encouragement, even if it's a little bit of food to someone sitting begging. Just pick up the phone, call someone, text someone. Give away something every day, a word of encouragement, a word of love, a word of, of appreciation. Just be generous, gracious. Thank God. Thank people. Thank your spouse. Thank your children. Thank your parents. Thank your pastors. Thank the team. Thank. Just become generous with your words 
with your possessions, with your actions and your attitudes. And look, I just want to say, this is model ministry. It's not too hard to do because why? Christ lives in me. And Paul was able to say, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's God in me. Emmanuel. He's there to help you. He gives us the power. He gives us the desire. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. May the Lord bless you richly. Father, bless your people. Every person that hears these words, bless them, bless them, bless them. Enlarge them. Edify, build them up, encourage them, strengthen them, give them faith to believe for bigger than they are living in now, to live all out for you. God bless them, their families, their churches, everything they put their hand to, that it will be directed by you and that they may look at what you're doing and say, what a wonderful God we serve. What a wonderful God. You are so good. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.